Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus, where we strive for supernatural immunity from the wickedness of today's world by focusing on the inspired, infallible words of Holy Scripture. Before we begin today's discussion, a short prayer. All blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so my power to speak truth without error, and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God. Any errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit so that any truth I speak or any scripture that I interpret correctly is welcomed in your heart, your mind, and your soul. If you end up enjoying today's video, please give it a thumbs up, a positive comment, share. If you haven't already done so, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could subscribe to the channel. If you don't like the video for whatever reason, feel free to give it a thumbs down and or a negative comment. But please, if you do give it a negative comment, watch the entire video and point out to me what I stated in this video that you believe is wrong. Now let us begin the discussion. Today's discussion is in the response to Unitarian Comments, Questions, and Objections playlist and is entitled Episode Number 15, Part 1. I received this comment from an Alexa Hovanovich, 3350. Forgive me for pronouncing that incorrectly. If I did, KJV superior to NIV and Jeremiah 5040 and Amos. Hey brother, I don't know if it YouTube deleted my comments or you, it's not me, but I just was wondering whether or not you are going to make more videos on defending Trinitarianism. I saw a recent video by the Gospel Truth, a debate, raising some good points on either side by God, logic, apologetics, Trinitarianism, and standing on scripture alone, Unitarianism, which might be even a few videos worth of info. So thanks for pointing this out to me, Alexa. All right, here's the Gospel Truth YouTube channel, 10.4 thousand subscribers, 431 videos at the time I did the screenshot. Here's God Logic Apologetics, 80.7 thousand subscribers, 269 videos at the time I did the screenshot. And here's Stand on Scripture, 590 subscribers, 364 videos at the time I did the scripture, screenshot. Now what's interesting about Stand on Scripture in this particular playlist uh, episode number one, number two, number three, and number eight were refuting some of the teachings of Stand on Scripture, if you'd like to check those out for interest. So here's the video. Does the Bible teach Unitarianism? It's a 2 hour and 15 minute, 46 second video. Um, it was streamed eight days prior to me doing the screenshot. At that point, 4.1 thousand views, 310 likes, 817 comments. So what I'm going to do in today's video is to go over Taylor Stewart, that stand on scripture, that's the Unitarian, his opening statement. And before we do so, let's go over some points. What do we agree upon, right? Trinitarian Christians and these Unitarians. There is one God, yod heh vav -He, Yahovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We agree upon that, correct? yod heh vav -He is uniquely divine, eternal, uncreated, creator of heaven and earth, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Right? We agree upon that, right? Only yod heh vav -He deserves worship. The person of the Father in the New Testament is yod heh vav -He. The Holy Spirit is divine, eternal, and uncreated. Lord Jesus was human. And Holy Scripture is divinely inspired, infallible, and without true contradiction. So I'm assuming we agree upon all those points, especially point seven, because we're going to go over Holy Scripture and see what it teaches. Now, what's a being? A being is what an entity is, while a person is who an entity is. So it's not the same thing. Additionally, a person can be defined as an entity with the following unique characteristics. Mind, intellect, emotions, desires, volition, will, can love, can be loved, can speak, can be spoken to, can witness, has a name. So when I refer it to person and the one being of God being three persons, so what God is, that one being happens to be three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the Trinitarian belief, and that is what Scripture teaches as we'll go over. Now, what do we disagree upon? Maybe more than this, but we, do, we disagree that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's a unique person, separate from the Father and from the Son. And Lord Jesus was also divine. He was human, but he was a divine. He was a God-man. So now let's look at the beginning of Taylor Stewart's introduction. Okay, so my opponent um, would have to show the possibility of plurality persons, one God. I have to obviously show that Jehovah God is one self, one person, one individual. Now, using um, the terms um, 
this person's called God does not necessitate that it's the same God. For example, Samuel in 1 Samuel 28 verse 13 is called God raising up from the um, earth. Moses in Exodus 7 verse 1 is God to Pharaoh. The judges are called gods in Psalms 82 verse 6. So my opponent would have to show clearly that Jehovah is the God that is multiple persons. Otherwise, when we see things that are clearly like I am Jehovah, there is no other person, me, and so on and so forth, you would have to say either one, God is the author of confusion, confusing people to think that he is one person, but really he's multiple persons. Or you would have to say that um, he is literally one person and not other. So when we look at things like um, Genesis 126, when it says, let us make man in our image, it doesn't say who the us actually is. And I would happily answer these questions in relation to Genesis 126 um, in the question um, time if my opponent would like to bring this up. Essentially, I believe that it is a prophetic form of speech that God's going to create through um, Adam and in the prophetic, like even further future through the um, man, Jesus Christ, in the spiritual um, person. Okay, so let's take a break there and go over some of his points. First off, First Samuel chapter 28, verse 13, And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? Remember, this is a witch, a pagan witch. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods, or God, ascending out of the earth, Elohim. So this is a witch, this is a pagan, right, who interacts with demons or whatever, who actually sees the spirit of, of Samuel arising, and to her, it's a God, okay? Is that the Bible calling Samuel God? No, it's a witch making this statement. So was Samuel actually God? Divine, eternal, uncreated, creator, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient? Of course not. This is what a witch said. Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. And again, Elohim as God. Again, was Moses actually God? Divine, eternal, uncreated, creator, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient? Of course not. Basically, the power of the Lord would assist Moses, and as far as Pharaoh was going to be concerned, he would be like God. But he's not God. He's not being called God, is he? Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Again, Elohim. Remember, it's a plural words. And ye, so it would be gods there, not God. Again, were the judges actually God? Divine, eternal, uncreated, creator, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient? Of course not. So let's go over Psalm 82, and it'll tie in to basically what we saw in Exodus, you'll see. All right, Psalm 82, verses 1 through 8, Psalm of Asaph. God, this is the God, the divine, eternal, uncreated creator of heaven and earth. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. So he's judging God, the God, is judging among these mighty, judging among these gods. Hmm. Who are these gods? How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Oh, so the mighty here, by the way, in the Septuagint congregation is synagogue. Oh, see, these are judges in the synagogue. These are human rulers, human judges. And notice, they're judging unjustly. They're accepting the person of the wicked, right? So why are they being called gods? Because they're granted authority on earth to judge, and God is the judge, right? So notice, where does the power come from? It comes from God, not from these men. Similar to what we saw in Exodus, the power came from God, not these men. Now here's the difference. In Exodus, Moses, who was granted this authority by God, was trying to do what was right. These judges are not. Verse three, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. This is what God wants them to do, but they don't. Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. This is what God wants them to do, but they don't. They know not, neither will they understand. These are these judges. They walk on in darkness. And because of this, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. So these are human rulers. These are human judges. They're called gods, not because they're divine, eternal, uncreated creator of heaven and earth, but because they're granted authority to judge and rule on earth by God. God wants them to do what was right. They don't. 
And because they don't, the foundations of the earth are out, of course. And then the verse, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men, because they're men, and fall like one of the princes, probably referring to Satan Lucifer, their spiritual father. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Now, interesting. Who's the God who arises and judges the earth? Oh, that's Lord Jesus, the divine son who took on flesh. Notice here, these gods are not gods. They're rulers on earth who are doing wickedness. And in a way, God's mocking them, calling them gods, isn't it? You think you're gods, and I have granted you authority, and you could do what was right, but you don't do what was right. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So notice he used this verse because he's confused about the nature of God, but blames God. Did you hear him? Since God is not the author of confusion and I'm confused, that proves that God must be one person. That's what he was saying. So notice anyone could use such an argument about something with which they disagree in the Bible, right? So since I disagree with doctrine X and God is not the author of confusion, that proves doctrine X is wrong. I mean, he actually made such an argument. And what's funny is, again, proving he doesn't understand scripture at all, stand on scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 to 33, to put verse 33 in context. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, they all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace." as in all churches of the saints. So this has nothing to do with agreeing or not agreeing with some particular doctrine. It has to do with how to act in the church and have the church not be some chaotic maniac mess. That's what 1 Corinthians verse 14, verse 33 refers to. And Taylor Stewart uses it because he's confused. And since he's confused and God can't be the author of confusion, that proves his belief True. Can you believe he made such an argument? Because here's the truth about God. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God is who God is. We can't completely understand him. He's above us. How can we understand the uncreated, eternal, divine God? Right? We can't even understand things within creation. For example, hey, Taylor Stewart, please explain to me exactly how an atom is held together because it doesn't make sense. Isn't it confusing? And what does that prove according to you? Similarly, explain exactly how black holes work and, and if you enter a black hole, what happens to you, Taylor Stewart? Okay, so obviously what he said regarding 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 is beyond laughable. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. And God said, let us make man. So notice, there's God speaking, right? Third person singular, God. Let us make. That's first person plural. Who's the us? Now, notice what he said that he would talk about later. How the us is prophetic and it's him and man. Really? So the us is him and man making man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So notice what extents Taylor Stewart will go to deny the obvious. There's more than one person speaking and they're about to make man in their image, their likeness, right? First person, pro, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And Taylor Stewart saying the us, the our, the our is actually prophetic about God and man making. How do you know that's false? Well, let's look at the next verse. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. So notice yet again, God is being referred in verses 26 and 27 as third person singular. God said, God created his own image, 
created he him, created he them, but then there's this, let us make our image, our likeness. Obviously, that's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit speaking, for sure, Father and Son, since the Son is the image of the Father. Now, some people will say, not Taylor Stewart, but the us was God and the angels. Genesis chapter two, verse one, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. So notice, heavens and earth were finished in the first seven days of creation, right? The first six days of creation and the seventh day God rested. So the host of the heavens, the host of the earth, the heavens refer to the spiritual dimension, not just the sky, and the earth refers to the physical dimension, not just you know the dirt. So host of heaven, who's the host of heaven? Psalm 148, verse two, praise ye him, all his angels, praise ye him, all his hosts. The host of heaven are angels. Notice the same Hebrew word in Genesis 2, 1, Sabaam, Hebrew Strong 66, 35, and Psalm 148, 2, Sabaao, Hebrew Strong 66, 35. So what does that prove? During the first six days of creation, God rested on the seventh day, the angels were created. So obviously the let us make was not God and the angels, it was God. It was not God and man prophetically, it was God and God is more than one person. Job chapter 38, verses four to seven. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding, obviously God speaking. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon the foundations they are fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So the angels were not involved with creation. Let us make has nothing with the angels. The angels were singing when God was creating the physical dimension, it appears. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So as creation was not God and the angels, was not God and man, it was God alone. Isaiah 43, 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. No true God, but the one true God. Here's the problem. John chapter one, verses one through three, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, obviously referring to Genesis 1.1. So it wasn't just God doing creation, it was God and the word. The same, the word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, this word, and without him was not anything made that was made. Wow, how do you reconcile this? John chapter one, verse 10, he was in the world, the word who was taken on flesh, of course, Lord Jesus, obviously, and the word was made by him, and the world knew him not. Now, what Taylor Stewart will do, will say, no, 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 that word, that's not, that's not the eternal divine son. No, 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 it's, it's just the words of God. It wasn't a person. No, that's not the name of a person, but it is the name of a person. Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, and he, this is the lamb, this is the son, this is the God, man, Lord Jesus, was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is, called the word of God. So the word is the son. So right there, this obviously proves, if you believe the Bible and that it doesn't contradict itself, that the one true God is more than one person. It's father and word, father and son, right? And let's now go back to Genesis chapter one, verse 26, let us make, that's father and son right there. Further explained in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, But to us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Right? Things are created entities. So Lord Jesus Christ is not a created entity, therefore he's uncreated. Again, proving the same thing. There's one God, Father, and Son, obviously, and Holy Spirit not being mentioned here. Ephesians chapter three, verse nine, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Obviously in the New Testament, God usually refers to the person of God, the Father, who created all things by Jesus Christ. It doesn't say the word, doesn't say the son, doesn't say the Lord, it says Jesus Christ. Obviously that person, the son, obviously he didn't have the name Jesus Christ and he was born in Bethlehem, but that's the person who at that time took on flesh, of course. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, the Son, right, the Word, Lord Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, power, all things were created by him and for him. They were made for him. The purpose of creation of the Father by the Son was for the Son. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. You're seeing this over and over in the New Testament, Taylor. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, This is God the Father speaking about the Son, and thou, Lord, Kyrios, remember, in the Koine Greek, Kyrios was how you would state yod heh vav heh, Jehovah, Yahovah, Yahweh in Greek, right? So there's the Father calling the Son, yod heh vav heh, in the beginning, again, referencing back to Genesis 1, 1, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. So notice, the Father is calling the Son creator by his hands, by the Son's hands. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, And unto the angel, the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, obviously referring to the Son, right, the Lamb, the God, man, Lord Jesus, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, by him, for him, through him. So notice, is Lord Jesus being referred to as God? Divine, eternal, uncreated, creator of heaven and earth? Yes. So this has nothing to do with what Taylor Stewart, stand on scripture, mentioned at the beginning regarding those other verses in the Old Testament. Because Lord Jesus is being called divine, eternal, uncreated creator of heaven and earth over and over and over because he is God, not the person of the Father. So Unitarianism is obviously false. Let's continue. Revelation chapter 22. Notice what we saw in the first book of the Bible. Let us make in our image, in our likeness, but then God created he, him, God created he, them. You're gonna see the same thing in the last book of the Bible, last chapter, Revelation 22. And he, this is the angel to John, showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, that's a reference to the Holy Spirit, by the way, proceeding out of the throne of God, meaning the person of God the Father, the Lamb, meaning the person of the Son. God the Son, by the way, knows two persons seated on this one throne, ruling over creation. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, right, the river, the water of life, the Holy Spirit, was it the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb, notice, two persons, God the Father, the Lamb, the Son, shall be in it, and pay attention, and his servant shall serve him. Huh? Notice you're seeing the same thing you saw back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 27, right? Let us make, and then... God said, let us make in our image, and then God created he, him, God created he, them. Weird, we're seeing the same thing here. Notice there's two persons on the throne, God and the Lamb, but then it's his servants, not their servants, serve him, not serve them, and they, the servants, shall see his face, and his name shall be in their forms. See, how do you explain all this? See, God is one male being who's made up of more than one male person, and that's why his servants, are the servants of the being of God, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, and neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign, these servants, forever and ever. How do you prove this? Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Notice his servants. Well, guess what? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, right? The person of God the Father. So notice... Obviously, the father has servants, but so does the son. So his servants is father and son, the masculine being of God. The one God is more than one person. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. His servants is the servants of God the Father and God the Son. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant, apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow, look what Peter's doing. He's calling Lord Jesus God. Again, in the New Testament, Lord usually refers to the person of the Son. God usually refers to the person of the Father. Here, God is referring to the Son, also the servant of the Son. Jude chapter 1, verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Daniel chapter 7. Let's look into these thrones, etc. 
verse 9 and then 13 and 14. I behold till the thrones were cast down. Thrones are where kings sit. There's more than one. And the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne of the thrones was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. So that's the person, the father sitting in one throne. Wait a minute, there's someone else sitting on another throne. Verse 13 to 14, I saw in the night visions to be on one like the son of man, one appears human, came with the clouds of heaven, well, only God rides clouds, and came to the ancient of days, and they, these angels, brought him near before him, so brought this son of man near before the ancient of days, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, oh, so he's going to sit on the other throne, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, remember we saw in Revelation 22, his servants serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, destroyed, eternal kingdom. So his father and son, by the way, this is the resurrected son after he ascends to heaven, by the way, in verse 13. Now, in the Koine Greek, the Septuagint serve is latreusa, which is servants only due to God. So that son of man, who's not the same person as the person of the ancient of days, obviously the father, is divine. He rides clouds. He rules over creation with the Father, right? And he receives sacred service, Lytreosa. And by the way, in Revelation 22, that same Greek verb is used. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, in regard to the name, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, right? The Son, and given him a name which is above every name. I wonder what name that is. It's the family name. That's why it's his name. Yod Hey Vav He is the family name. God is a family, eternal family of love, friendship, and communion. Okay? The Father's at the top of the family structure. That's why he's called Father. He's highest in authority, but they're all in the one family. God is a family. And the name of the family is given back his name. That's why it's greater than every name. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, being made so much better than the angels. This is talking about Lord Jesus in his resurrected body, in his spiritual mortal body, or referring to the fact that he now again rules as king, because remember, he lowered himself to be a servant, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What do you get an inheritance from? Oh, from your family. So it's the family name he got back, yod heh vav -he, king of kings. Revelation 14, one, and I looked, this is in the Berean literal Bible. And behold, the lamb was standing upon Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father, having been written on their foreheads. Some of the Greek manuscripts say this. Some of them just say the name of his father. And what's interesting is, is it the same name? yod heh vav -he? Probably is. That's why his name's on their forehead because it's the name of father and son, yod heh vav -he, family name. Exodus chapter 23, verse 21. This is God speaking about the angel of the Lord. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, but only God can pardon transgressions. For not my name, my destiny, my character is in him. The family name is in him because the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate son, obviously, and they share the name. My name is in him, right? The name of the father is in the son. yod heh -Vav is in the son, family name. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, obviously referring to the Messiah in the future, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, see? And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor, the Everlasting Father, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. So does this male son is the Mighty God, only used otherwise for God. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, right? Jesus, Iesus which is the Greek rendering of Yehoshua, which means yod heh vav -He saves, for he shall save. Oh, so he's being called Jesus, Yehoshua, which means yod heh vav -He saves, for he will save? Oh, you mean because he's yod heh vav -He, right? Save his people from their sins. Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the lamb is the light thereof. But wait a minute, the Lord God gives him light, and the lamb is the light. How is that? Because the Lamb is the Lord God. But wait a minute. The Father's the Lord God too. Exactly. But there's only one God. Exactly. See, Unitarianism is false. God is a family. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is scriptural, right? This is true interpretation, not the false interpretation of Taylor Stewart and such individuals. Continuing, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. See, no, Lord Jesus isn't a separate lesser God. 
No, there's one God, but that one God is more than one person. It's the only thing that explains all this. Otherwise, you have contradictions or you're just not believing Scripture. I killed and I make life. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Oh, okay. John chapter 10, verse 24 to 30. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. That's why, by the way, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he's called the eternal father, because he's the father or the source of eternal life. Lord Jesus gives them, his sheep, eternal life. And they shall never perish. Pay attention. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So verse 28 and 29. Both Father and Son have the same power, which as we just saw, is only the power of God. I and my Father are one. They're one in the family of God. They're one God. They're one in this divine power that only God has, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Continuing, John chapter 10, verse 31 to 39. Notice how the Jews respond. Notice what the Jews thought when he said, I and the Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, the many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So the Jews understood what Lord Jesus was stating in John chapter 10, verse 30. Taylor Stewart doesn't. Who would know better? The Jews there, Taylor Stewart now. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods, hearkening back to Psalm 82, which again was God mocking them. So he's mocking them. If he called them gods, these wicked men, unto whom the word of God came, who's the word of God? Lord Jesus, anyway. And the scripture cannot be broken. Say ye of him who the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world that thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God. Notice. These wicked judges were mocked as gods. I am the Son of God. I am the Word of God, right? Which led to that being written, and, and you're saying I'm blaspheming. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him, right? In the one being of God, in the family of God, right? Therefore, they sought again to take him. He escaped out of their hand. Because yet again in verse 38, they knew he was declaring himself God. Now, I can show explicitly that Jehovah is one self. In Isaiah 64, verse 8, it says, Now, Jehovah, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter, we are the work of your hands. And we see this also in relation to Genesis 2, verse 7, how God creates us from the, um, from the earth and breathes the breath of life into that body. If God cannot communicate that he is plural persons as a singular um, being God, then how can that God actually judge anyone to hell for not worshiping a triune God or even a quadrinity, a binitarian or multiple person God? Now, according to, um, according to the Bible, it says that you know, um, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob glorified Yehoshua, Jesus, his servant, as seen in Acts 3, verse 13, which says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus, who you delivered and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. Point one for my opponent to raise in his rebuttals, if you'd like to, is how many persons is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who glorified his son? Understanding that Yehoshua, his servant, Yehoshua never glorified himself, which we'll be looking into a verse later on. I would like to also point out and build a premise that Yehovah um, is being spoken of as oneself, that is the true God in such by Yehoshua. And we see this in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18 to 19. I will raise up a prophet from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. I will command him what to speak. And anyone that does not listen to my words that he speaks in my name, I will hold them, or I will require of him, or I will hold them accountable. And we know that this is talking about the Messiah in Acts 3, verse 19 to 22, because it literally says that God speaks through the prophets, and Moses said this 
and it was in relation to him. So what did Yehoshua himself say in relation to who Jehovah God is? We must listen and obey to the Messiah, Yehoshua, and what he actually says about God. In John 4, verse 23 to 24, but a time is coming and has now arrived when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. But the Father seeks such as these to be his worshippers. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Take note that Yehoshua is saying the Father is the God that the true worshippers worship and that that God is spirit. In John 8, 54, Jesus answers, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. It is the Father who glorifies me of who you say he is our God, talking to the Jews. Again, just like before, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob glorified his servant, Jesus Christ. John 17, verse 1 to 3, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to those you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and the one that you have sent, Jesus Christ. Yehoshua is quite clearly saying that the Father is the only true God. This statement is an appositive, and a positive is a descriptive sentence that or a phrase that is in relation to what is beforehand. It would make sense that if you take it out, the sentence would still make sense that they know you and the one that you have sent, Jesus Christ. This a positive is descriptive of the one that is the you, the father, and is also according to monos or monon in Greek. It is meaning it is an adjective alone without a companion. So point B, it is tied with this noun to other verbs also, so that what is predicated may be declared to apply to some one person alone, according to C.F. Weiner's grammar on Bible hope. In John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say, I am going to my father, your father, my God, your God. It is quite clear then that the God of Jesus is a Unitarian God, the Father, and the God of the disciples is also that God. So when we look so far, what we've seen is that the true worshippers worship the Father, not a multi-personal God. The Jews call their Father their God, not a multi-personal God. The only true God is the Father with the apostle of case and the law of identity and definition as stated on Bible hope. For his God and the disciples' God is the same, which is the Father, not multi-personal God. All right, so let's go over what he just said there. First off, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Okay? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So notice in the initial creation, it was Lord God breathing the breath of life. What's interesting about this, if you look at John chapter 20, verses 22 to 23, this is the resurrected Lord Jesus. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So as he's breathing the Holy Ghost, right? The breath of life of the new creation. Why? Because he's God. And notice, just as he had power to remit sin, right? Given to him by God the Father. He, God the Son, gives the disciples power to remit sin. Only God could do that. Notice that he again blames God. Did you hear him? Well, how can God judge me? How can God judge someone who doesn't understand this? That's ridiculous, right? He again blames God, stating it's God's fault that he can't recognize the Holy Trinity is indeed true, right? And that anyone again could make the same argument about why they don't accept a certain aspect of the true nature of God, right? Well, I don't understand it, so therefore it can't be true because otherwise it wouldn't be fair for God to judge me. What a completely ridiculous point. See, Taylor Stewart, the reason you can't believe this is you don't want to believe this. You see, but don't perceive. You hear, but don't understand, as we see in Isaiah chapter 6. That's why it is your fault, right? You've heard all these arguments. You refuse to accept them because you trust yourself. You refuse to admit you're wrong. 
Acts chapter 3, verse 13. NIV version, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. That's in the NIV of that particular verse. Here's the KJV. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son, Jesus, not servant, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. What does the Greek actually say? Does it say servant? Does it say son? It says pedia. Now it says servant here, but pedia means children, pediatrics, that's child. So it should be hath glorified his child, Jesus. So it's not a servant, it's a child. And a son obviously is a child. Philippians chapter two, verses five through eight here. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. It's a humble mind, by the way who, Christ Jesus, being in the form of God. So that's in the state of God, right? In the form, what would that be? Uh, you know, well, obviously God doesn't have a form, but is that being divine, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent? Is that being king of kings, lord of lords, right? Ruler of the cosmos? That's the form he was in. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Hmm, what's robbery? Taking something you don't own. So it's not robbery, taking something you do own. So he owned being equal with God, the person of God the Father, in his divinity, right? In being the King of kings, the Lord of lords, right? The ruler of the cosmos. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Here's the servant. So he was eternal God who took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That's who's the Messiah, Taylor Stewart. That's who's Lord Jesus Christ who was in the form of God, who was equal with God, meaning the person of God the Father, and took upon him, lowered himself by becoming human and took on the form or the state of a servant, right? Human servants, angelic servants. He took on the form of a human servant. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, right? He humbled himself. He was God. He became a servant. He became man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, physical death, of course. Deuteronomy chapter 18 that Taylor Stewart mentions, verses 18 to 19. I will raise them up, a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. All right? Lord Jesus was a God man. This is speaking to his human nature. Yes, he was a human. The problem is, Taylor Stewart, he wasn't just a human. So yes, he was a human. He was. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 22. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the time of refreshing shall come for the presence of the Lord. And ye shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Yes, Lord Jesus was a man. He was an Israelite. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. He was a son of David. But he wasn't just that. Matthew chapter 17. Here's Lord Jesus showing his true glory. Remember, he humbled himself. He left the glory of being God, ruling to become a servant, a human servant. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, his raiment was white as the light. There's his true glory. Yes, he didn't brag about it. He was humble. He was a servant who went to death on the cross, okay? Just because he didn't glorify himself, so what? What does that prove? Nothing. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. And I turned, this is St. John on Patmos, to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. That's that Son of Man reference back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And gird about the paps with a golden girdle. This is a reference to God as he appeared in Ezekiel, by the way. His head and his hairs were white like wool. Notice he's appearing like the Ancient of Days from Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Again, referencing to Ezekiel. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Here's his real glory, Taylor Stewart. 
and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. All right, he's the image of the Father, and he's appearing similar to the Father, the Ancient of Days, from Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, of course. Revelation chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. And every creature, this is every created sentient being, which is in heaven, like angels, right, and saints, and on the earth, like living humans, and under the earth, right, the dead, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them. St. John does this many times. He repeats concepts, right? Right, in, in, in John 1, 1, right? In John 1, 2, in John 1, 3, right? Where the word made everything, everything was made by the word. He repeats, he's repeating here, right? Every creature in heaven, every creature on earth, every creature under the earth, every creature in the sea and all that are in them, repeating again, heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne. That's the person, the father, God, the father and unto the lamb. There's the God, man, Lord Jesus, sharing glory, equal glory from all creation, which proves what? He has the same glory, the same blessing, the same honor, the same power, right? And he's uncreated. Every created thing in one category, and God the Father and Lamb, God the Son in the other. And the four be said, amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. And they're worshiping Father and Son here. How do you know that? Revelation chapter one, verse 18. This is Lord Jesus speaking to John. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. In the Greek, I am, alef, I am alive forevermore is the exact same wording as worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. So I am alive forevermore, liveth forever and ever, same exact Greek words, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So he's being worshiped by all creation. And yes, Taylor Stewart, only God is due worship. And there's Lord Jesus, the Lamb, the God, man, the Son, being worshiped forever by all creation, along with the Father, identical, eternal worship. John chapter four, verse 23 to 24, that Taylor Stewart mentioned. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father, that person, in spirit and in truth. Hmm. Father, spirit, Holy Spirit, truth. Who is the truth? Lord Jesus. So how do you worship the Father? In the Holy Spirit and in the Son, in spirit and in truth. Spirit, Holy Spirit, truth, the Son. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Right. He wants you to worship him and the Holy Spirit and the Son because that family is truly God. God is a spirit. Really, it says God is spirit. That's his nature because he's not physical. physical. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Again, this is to the Samaritan woman who, you know, was wondering about worshiping on the mountain, whether in the mountain or in Jerusalem, in some physical locale. No, you not you don't worship him in some sort of physical carnal manner. You worship him in a spiritual manner. That's what it means by God is spirit. And then again, spirit and in truth, Father, Spirit, Truth. You don't think that's a reference to the Holy Trinity? Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, right? The very end of the first gospel. And Jesus came and spake unto them, his disciples. This is, by the way, right after they worshiped him. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he's omnipotent in heaven and earth. That's a God, right? Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, one name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Father, Spirit, Truth teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. How can Lord Jesus be with them and all believers always until the end of the world? He would have to be omnipotent. Well, he has been given all power, but he'd have to be omnipresent and omniscient. He had to be everywhere in the world and know who his uh, believers are, right? So again, he's God. It's not just like these references in the Old Testament that Tiller Stewart started with Pharaoh uh, and, and Moses and the wicked judges and, and the witch uh, in terms of Samuel. So is Lord Jesus right here at the end of the first gospel being referred to as God, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient? Yes, he is because he is God, just not the same person as the Father because God is multipersonal and Unitarianism is false and not biblical. Matthew chapter four, verse 10. Then says Jesus unto him, uh, this is to Satan, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. That's right. And Jesus was worshiped and all creation, as you saw there in Revelation 5, verses 13 to 14, worship Father and Son forever and ever. 
and him only shalt thou serve, him only shalt thou serve. And by the way, that's that latreusa word, which we saw in Revelation 22, right? We also, by the way, saw it in um, Daniel chapter 7, being given to the Son of Man. That's right. Latreusa, divine service, is only due to God. And the Son of Man got it in Daniel chapter 7, and Father and Son both get it in Revelation chapter 22. Now, worship, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Let's just look at Matthew. It's gospel. This is when he was a child, a two-year-old, saying, where is he? This is the Magi that is born king of the Jews. For we have come, for, excuse me, we have seen his star in these and are come to worship him. Uh, six verses later, and he sent them to Bethlehem, this is Herod, and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Uh, uh, three verses later, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child, so this is not an infant, he's a two-year-old, with Mary's mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold for a king, frankincense because he's God, right? And mirror because he's gonna die. How did they know this? Because they came from Babylon and they were instructed, you know, their ancestors were instructed by Daniel. Remember, if you look at Daniel with that dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he was about to kill all the magi and all the sorcerers because they couldn't figure out his dream. And Daniel came and told him what his dream was and interpreted it. And because of that, all these magi and sorcerers weren't killed. So at that time, way back then in Babylon during the captivity, they understood that Daniel knew the true God and Daniel taught them about the divine Messiah coming, right? Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, for example. So that's why they knew to give him these gifts. Gold, he's a king. Frankincense, that's an offering unto God. Look at some of the uh, sacrifices to God in the Old Testament, of course. And myrrh, which would be you know part of... Uh, ointments, etc., for funerals. So they knew he was going to physically die again because of what Daniel taught them. Matthew chapter 14, verse 33. Then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Right? Only God can be worshiped. That's right, stand on scripture. And here's Lord Jesus being worshiped over and over and over and accepting it. Matthew chapter 28, verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. And then that verse 17, which was before verses 18 to 20, we just looked at when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Amazingly, some doubted. John chapter 9, verse 38. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. That was the man who was born blind. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, that's the father bringing the son into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. So this is the father demanding that the angels of God, the angelic spirit being servants, worship the son, right? Obviously, the son is also God. The father is God and his son is God. John chapter 8, verses 54 to 59 here. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that, father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God, right? Because he's humbled himself. He's become a servant, right? He lowered himself, but his father still honored him, obviously. Ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw and was glad. Proving he preexisted, obviously. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am a emi. Remember in the Septuagint, when the angel of the Lord, the Lord spoke out of the burning bush and declared, I am that I am. Eye aser eye, in the Koine Greek, was ego emi o on, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him. And we know from John chapter 10, when when they do this? Because he was declaring himself God. So they knew what he meant when he said, before Abraham was, I am. They took uh, then up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by, again showing his power. Now, John chapter 17 he brings up. It's so funny when verse 3 is brought up, uh, because let's just read a few verses later, put all this in context. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So notice they're glorifying each other, by the way. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So notice, eternal life is knowing the Father and the Son, right? Now the only true God will get into that. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. But look at verse 5. 
And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Oh, so they were mutual glory prior to creation. But that would mean he's uncreated, divine, eternal, creator of heaven and earth and God. Exactly. So bring up verse 3. Well, you have to put it into uh, connection with verse 5. So what you think it means, Taylor Stewart, is not what it means. But let's look further. Monon alithinon theon. The only true God or the God of truth. Hmm. Who is the truth? John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Again, how could he be before him? He comes later, and he was born later because he's before, because he's the eternal divine Son of God. It's right there, of course. And of his fullness have we received in grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him or made him known. Right there, if you understand the Old Testament, that proves the Son was there. Because no one has seen the Father unless the Son was there to allow you to see the Father. Well, we saw God in the Old Testament, so the Son had to be there. But again, notice the connections of Lord Jesus to truth. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. So who is true? Who are we in? Who's true? Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, Lord Jesus coming, right? And I saw, his name was the Word of God, right? And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he thought judge and make war. So the Father is the God of truth. Who's the truth? Lord Jesus. So the Father is the God of Lord Jesus. That's what that means. And we have to put that in connection with this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord is exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So notice everything's about Christ Jesus. Verse 7, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And amen. So if John 17, 3, where the Father is called the only true God, proves the Son can't be God, well, notice what this would prove. Lord Jesus is the only wise God. So that's not what it means, Taylor Stewart. By the way, the only true God is because he's the God of truth, because Lord Jesus, the truth, took on flesh, became a man. And not the divine part, but the man part had a God. And the person is the truth. So when he was the son, he was the truth. And when he's the God-man, the son who took on flesh, he's the truth. But now, when the son, when truth, took on flesh and had a God, because all flesh has a God, that's when the father became the God of the Son, the, the human portion of the Son, the human nature of the Son, and thus the God of truth. That's what it means, Taylor Stewart. But notice this, the only wise God. Now, it's funny, the only wise God is in some Greek manuscripts. In other Greek manuscripts, it says the only God, monotheo. So notice how this completely erupts and destroys his ridiculous argument that he brings up, this whole mono is only. Okay, that's great. Therefore, 1 Timothy 1.17 says that Lord Jesus is the only God or the only wise God. Hmm. So why would the Father be the God of truth or the only God of truth? Well, because Lord Jesus is the truth. And when he took on flesh, the Father became his God. And therefore, the Father became the God of truth or the only true God. Well, how would the Son be the only wise God? Well, Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom, verses 22 to 25 here, the Lord possessed me, wisdom, in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, right? When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. So Lord Jesus, obviously referencing wisdom here, thus the only wise God, the God of wisdom, because he's wisdom. He's the Father's wisdom. 
John chapter 17, verse 24. And then considering John 17, verse 3, I showed you John 17, verse 5. I explained why the Father is the God of truth or the only God of truth because Lord Jesus is the truth. And then we talked about verse 5, which shows Taylor Stewart's silly interpretation of verse 3 is false. But let's look at verse 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, referring to his disciples, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. This is his true glory that he set aside when he humbled himself, which was on Philippians 2, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So the father and son were in love with each other prior to creation. So obviously he's uncreated, he's God, living eternally with the father and the spirit, right? The family of God in mutual love. And again, what is love? What is love? It's loving another. So if there's a mother with her two children and she's going to cross the street and there's a car coming, what would be an expression of love? Her saving herself and not letting and allowing her children to be hit and God forbid, or saving the children and possibly getting hit by the car herself. Obviously the latter. Love means loving another person. And notice, and we're going to see God is love. And this really proves it all proves Unitarianism has to be false and God has to be multipersonal, right? Because otherwise, love is not what you think it is, right? So if God is just one person, like Taylor Stewart believes, in eternity past, right? There was only one person. And if God is love and love is eternal, which God is love and love is eternal, that would mean that what true love is is narcissism. God just loved himself. There wasn't any other person. And only after creation, when he made other sentient beings like angels and humans as his servants, could God know love like we know love? Really? So notice, God, there was no real love. And God had no one to talk to, no one to commune with, no one to love, nothing to do. And now because of creation and sentient beings, he has someone to talk to, someone to care about, someone to love. That's your God, Taylor Stewart. Here's the real God. There's always been love as we know it. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit always loved each other, other persons, one being, one family. And now it's not that creation allows love to exist. Creation allows love's love to increase. And we eventually marry into this family. Now, we're never of the blood of the family, right? We're adopted and we marry in. But we share with the love and communion with the family because family is everything. And personally, I think there's something, who knows, but there's got to be some psychological reason why Taylor Stewart has a problem with this. So what's his problem with love? What's his problem with family that he just can't get this? That's what love is, okay? Love proves it all. Otherwise, love is not what you think it is. And God is love means narcissism. And narcissism is pathology. 1 John 4, 8 and 16. Again, as I showed you in Revelation chapter 5 and going back to the prologue of John, John repeats important points. 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Just like God is eternal, divine, uncreated creator of heaven and earth, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, God is love. That's an eternal characteristic. So, because love is loving another person, it proves it all. For God to be love, there has to be more than one person. And then eight verses later, we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. That's just one example. John Chapter 13, verse 34, as you're going to doubt what love really is, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That's what love is. It's loving another person. God is love, proving God must be multipersonal because God is multipersonal. God is a family of love, communion, and friendship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John chapter 20, verse 17. Now let's get into how can God have a God and truth? What God of truth? What are you talking about? Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, right, a spiritual brethren, the disciples, and say unto them, I ascended to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Well, how can Jesus be God if he has a God? Again, he's a God-man. 
Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Again, this is Lord Jesus speaking. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and name the city of my God. Wow, look how often St. John is talking about this, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And will write upon him my new name. Hmm. So it's not just in John chapter 17. It's in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12 right here. How can this be? As I mentioned earlier, I'll show you the verses. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Oh, so when the eternal divine Son took on flesh and became a man, since God is the God of all flesh, the Father became his God, right? He didn't become his own God. That other person, the Father, became his God. And thus, oh, truth took on flesh. Oh, and the Father became the God of truth, the only true God. I gotcha. Psalm 22, 10. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Right? Could we ever say that? No. God was always our God. But if you're God, and you don't have a God, but you took on flesh, now you have a God. And that's why Psalm 22.10, obviously, because Psalm 22 is talking about Lord Jesus in the future. But notice verse 10 right there. So that explains it all. Those two points are explained. And by the way, if you're going to look at John 20.17, why don't you read a little bit further, Taylor Stewart? Verses 28 to 31 here. And T Thomas answered and said unto my Lord and my God, O Kyriosmu, the Lord of me, Keo, Theosmu, and the God of me. Why? He just saw Lord Jesus materialize in a room. He just saw Lord Jesus resurrect himself as he promised. And he just saw Jesus, Lord Jesus challenge him with what he had challenged the disciples about when it didn't appear that Lord Jesus was in the room, but he was because he's God. So Thomas saw these three miracles, three, three signs, and understood the truth of Lord Jesus, that he is my Lord and my God, your Lord and your God, and Taylor Stewart's Lord and Taylor Stewart's God, although Taylor Stewart has a problem with this. Jesus saith unto Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, believe this truth. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. See, I'm blessed, and if you believe this, you're blessed, but since Taylor Stewart doesn't believe this, I guess he's not blessed. At least according to the Lord Jesus, he's not. And many other signs or miracles truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. I just mentioned, because there were just three signs, three miracles right there, as I mentioned. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And forgive the little typo down there where it's repeated. Again, Lord Jesus is our Lord. He's our God. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. He's God, but not the person of the Father. So you need to understand when, you know, Taylor Stewart says, oh yeah, he's the Messiah. That's right, he's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's God, but not the person of the Father. He's my Lord, and he's my God. He's your Lord, and he's your God. And my next point, um, I would like my opponent to raise in his rebuttals. When we look in Deuteronomy 4, verse 12 to 13, which I know some of you guys thought I was going to bring this up, may I? It says, then Jehovah spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. For those that are sincere in their walk and, and love Jehovah God, how many persons speak a voice that is a he in the pronoun contextually being spoken of here? Me, I would say it's one, right? So then when we see in Deuteronomy 4, verse 35 to 36, the same chapter, same context, it says, to you it was shown that you might know that Jehovah is God and there is no other beside him. Out of the heavens, he let you hear his voice and he may, uh, that he might discipline you on the earth and he let you see his great fire. You heard the sound of words um, out of the midst of the fire. So this is talking about a him as Jehovah that there is no other besides, which means that negates other persons or things being the Jehovah God that was speaking. So then why is the same chapter clearly showing this? We see the same thing in Isaiah 45, verse 5. I need Jehovah. I am Jehovah. And there is no other besides me. There is no God. I equip you. Though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising to this um, and from the, the rising of the sun and from the west 
that there is none besides me. I am Yehovah and there is no other. This explicitly negates any other persons when you have the first person pronoun ani in Hebrew or anoki, which is also related to the yod here, bav here, which by the way in itself is singular as well. In relation to the one person, which we know is talking about the um, father in uh, Isaiah 64 verse 8, which is a, in relation to verse 9 of Isaiah 48. Five, verse 9, where it is a potter, and it says, you, Jehovah, are our father, we are the clay, you are the potter. And he also says in verse 11 of Isaiah 45, that you ask me concern my sons. Now, when we do the exegesis of Deuteronomy 2, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy 6, verse 2 before, it says this, that you may fear Jehovah your God, and you, uh, your sons, your sons, sons, by keeping his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all of the days of your life, that your days may be long. Then in verse 4, going on, it says, Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, Jehovah is our God, Jehovah is one. Shema Israel, Jehovah Elohim, Jehovah Echad. Echad is a cardinal number and is only a compound unity when the context of the um, passage is seen. However, here it is explicitly relating to a hymn. And we see this in relation to Mark 12, verse 28 to 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered well, talking about Jesus, asking him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered. The most important is, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah is our God, Jehovah is one. And you shall love Jehovah your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. The second is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other great commandments such as these. Then the scribe responds, You would truly state that he is one. There is no other beside him. Notice the pronoun him and he is being used relating to the Shema, not they, them, plurality of persons. And to love, the, um, to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and to love one's neighbor is much greater than burnt offerings and sacrifices. Verse 34, Jesus saw that this was wise or intelligent, depending on the translation. He said, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. Then no one dared to ask him any more questions. So to um, finalize, when we see here that the scribe is asking um, what is the greatest commandment, and he says the Shema, and it's the greatest commandment, we see he is one and no other beside him. That statement in itself negates the possibility of other things or persons other than a he who is Jehovah. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. And also we see that in relation to Mark 12 verse 28 to 34, which we've just seen. We see in relation to Deuteronomy 4 verse 35 to 36 and Deuteronomy 4 verse 11 to 13. It's a he, it's a him, a voice, and there's no other beside him. So how is there any plural persons as Jehovah if God, according to the Jewish scribe, is a he and no other beside him, and the true worshippers worship him as God? I'll end them there. All right, so let's look into this. First off, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 12 to 14. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that ye might do in the land whither ye go over to possess it. All right, the voice, the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord, hmm, the messenger of his face. So the voice of the Lord actually could represent the person of the Son, the Word, right? Could be that anyway, but let's continue. Exodus chapter 3, again, the angel of the Lord, that unique messenger of the face of God, who is God, but separate from another person of God, and I'm not going to go into all the proof of that. What's interesting is that's who speaks out of the fire to Moses in terms of the burning bush. Pay attention. Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. And the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, right? The Lord speaks. The Lord sends a message. That would be his voice. That would be his word. So the messenger of his face, the word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the word, right? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. Who's in the bush? The angel of the Lord, that person, right? 
And when the Lord saw, what? All of a sudden, see the Lord? Do you see this? That he turned aside to see God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. So notice the angel of the Lord, suddenly is the Lord, suddenly is God, right? And uh, he said, here am I. And he said, this is the angel of the Lord, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Hmm, so who's saying that? Well, it's the angel of the Lord, or is it the Lord, or is it God? Who's saying that? Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he is afraid to look upon God. Right there, it proves it all. Of course, Taylor Stewart won't see this. But notice, it doesn't say they, them. And obviously, there's more than one person here. The angel of the Lord, right, which is not the same person as the Lord. I'm not going to show this necessarily, but there's verses where there's two different persons or persons are in that verse. And yet, that angel of the Lord Notice it's the Lord, it's God. It's the God of thy father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Because guess what? The angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate son who is God, but not the same person of God as another person of God, namely the father. Continuing, Exodus chapter three, verses 13 through 16. And Moses said unto God, again, who was this God? Well, it was the angel of the Lord. Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Eye aser eye. Ero emi oon. Remember we saw that in John 8. And that's why the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Uh, by the way, in the Koine Greek, it's oon. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Remember, my name is in him. <laughs> that name is in the angel of the Lord, right? That name, the name above all names, the family name, obviously. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which was done to you in Egypt. Again, God is a male being, right? Male energy represents divinity. Female energy represents humanity. Remember the reconciliation of mankind. Humanity saved humanity, perfected humanity, right? The church the bride of Revelation 19, marries the son to enter the family. So the son representing divinity, masculine, and the bride representing humanity, feminine. Joshua chapter 5. Remember that statement of the holy ground, take off thy sandals? Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 to 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us? or for our adversaries. And he said, this man, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come, right? So you're for me. I'm not for you and I'm not for the people in Jericho. You're for me. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto a servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy shoe from off thy foot for the place whereupon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. This is the angel of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the captain of the Lord's host, right? The pre-incarnate son. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 2. Why did God pick Abraham and Isaac? Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 2. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. What well, wasn't his only son, right? It was the son of promise, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of, so the mountains of Moriah. Skip ahead to verses 7 and 8. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father, and said, My father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, Pay attention to the wording, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Verses 11 through 13, pay attention. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven. Wow. Notice, show me anywhere where some angelic spirit being, created being, speaks out of heaven. 
This is the pre-incarnate son, right? The voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord. We saw him in Joshua 5 as the captain of the host of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the land, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. From who? From me. Why? Because the angel of the Lord is God, the messenger of his face, the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the pre-incarnate son. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, his two horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for burnt offering in the stead of his son. So notice God will provide himself a lamb, but a ram appears with two horns caught in a thicket of thorns, right? Notice this is a, a foreshadowing of the crucifixion of Lord Jesus. By the way, probably at that same location, Mount Moriah, many years earlier, or if you forgive me, many years later, right? Two horns representing what? I don't know, king of he heaven, king of earth, right? King of kings, lord of lords, and obviously the, 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 the thorns representing the crown of thorns. And again, notice God will provide himself a lamb because the eternal son, who's not the father, but still God, God is a family. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that masculine being, that's the he. The us is the three persons within that masculine being. And by the way, yet again, for God to be love, God must be multipersonal. And again, God will provide himself a lamb. A ram appears with this foreshadowing of the crucifixion, the crown of thorns. And again, why did God pick Abraham and Isaac? Because that father Abraham and that son Isaac, right, we're willing to do what God the Father and God the Son were going to do in the future. Genesis 31, verses 11 to 13. Pay attention here. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle, ring streaks, speckled and grizzled, for I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest that pillar, and where thou vowest to vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out of this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. What else do you want? The angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord, right? I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest a pillar, and they vowed a vow unto me. Genesis 35, 1, if you want more. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest the face of Esau thy brother. Notice, Make an altar not unto me, unto God, <laughs> right? Yet again, you're seeing this. So who's the first God? I guess it would be the person of the Father. Who's the second God? We just saw that's the angel of the Lord. That's the pre-incarnate son. So one God, more than one person. God is multi-personal. New Testament, Old Testament. Taylor Stewart refuses to see this because then he would be wrong. He cannot have that. Genesis chapter 48, this is 15 to 16. And he blessed Joseph and said, this is Israel, God before whom my fathers Abraham Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads and let my name be named on them and let the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. I could show you more. This is the pre-incarnate son. And that's why, notice, they're the same, they're God, there's only one God, but there's more than one person. And there's not a quadrinity, there's three persons and three persons only, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Old Testament, New Testament. We're focusing primarily, obviously, on the Father and Son. How about this, Hosea chapter 12? He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God, right? I'm not showing you when he wrestled with the man who was an angel who was God. That's in uh, Genesis 32, but that's what's being referred to here. Notice, he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel. And prevailed, he wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, right? That's that angel of the Lord who's God, but not another person of God. And there he spake with us. There's the us reference yet again. And notice, he spake with us even the Lord God of hosts. So the Lord God of hosts is an us. Yes, often, most often, God is referred to as a he 
as an I. But notice God is referred to as an us, never as a them, but as an us. The Lord is his memorial. Genesis 19, 24. Then the Lord, this was the Lord who appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18, accompanied by two angels, right? Appearing as men, eating food, etc. That Lord on earth rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. What? Two yod Hevaves interacting in the same verse? How can this be, Taylor Stewart? We understand because God is not a Unitarian being. God is a Trinitarian being. And you see the pre-incarnate Son on earth appearing as a man, the voice of the Lord, word of the Lord, angel of the Lord, pre-incarnate Son, and the Lord out of heason would be the Father. Uh, and pay attention to this, Jeremiah 50, 40. As God overthrew Sodom and Agora and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, it would be as I overthrew, but no, as God overthrew Sodom and Agora and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell there. Notice, the Lord is referring to God as an other person. Amos 4, 11. I have overthrown some of you, this is the Lord speaking, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Yet again, same points over and over and over. And this individual refuses to see this, will explain it away with silly statements. Because basically it's, well, that's how I see it, so therefore it's true. Ridiculous, just ridiculous. The world doesn't revolve around you just like it doesn't revolve around me. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 35 to 36. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God, there is none else beside him. We just saw how there's the Lord, there's God, there's God, there's this other God, there's one God. Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice. Well, the voice is the word, is the message, right? That his voice, by the way, is the pre-incarnate son. That voice is another person right there and Taylor Stewart can't see it. Isn't that funny? John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. What's the word? It's the voice. Are you kidding me? That he might instruct thee and upon earth he showed thee his great fire and thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. And who was speaking out of that fire? It says it right there. It says it was the Lord. It says it was God. But if you go back, who initially was the person? It was the angel of the Lord speaking out of the fire. And we're being told, no, that was God, exactly. And then pay attention to this, Genesis chapter three, verse eight. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. How does a voice walk? Because it's another person. This is the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the messenger of his face, the angel of the Lord, right? The angel means a message. Well, if I'm speaking, that's my message, isn't it? And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Notice the voice of the Lord God walking. Well, voices don't walk, so that's the name of a person. You're seeing the same thing where it's the Lord God, but it's somehow distinct from another person, the Lord God, because otherwise it would just say, and they heard the Lord God walking. No, but they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. And you see all these other distinctions that we went over. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Four verses later. And he brought him forth abroad. How do words bring you forth abroad, take you outside and show you things? Because the word of the Lord is the name of a person. And said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. Two verses later. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldeas to give thee this land to inherit. So you're seeing the same points over and over and over. It's the word of the Lord. It's the name of a person. But it's distinct from another person, the Lord, because you see these interactions. You know, for example, in Genesis 19, 24, and all those other verses referring back to it, where the Lord said, as God did this, right? The Lord speaking, he said, as God did this, speaking as another person. Isaiah chapter 45, verses five to six. I am the Lord, and there is none else. That's true. There is no God beside me. These aren't multiple gods. One God, one being, one family. It's easy to understand if you love the concept of family. What if you've had emotional, psychological problems, and you just can't admit that God is a family because family has hurt you. Similar to, it's similar to Muhammad, right? He, he had so many problems with his father and his uncle and his mother, and no one wanted him. He just couldn't conceive. He couldn't accept that God could be a father. 
It's the same thing here. It appears that Taylor Stewart, I'm assuming, what's his problem with understanding that God is a family? It's an easy thing to understand. He refuses to accept it, it appears. Isaiah chapter 45 again. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God besides me. Amen. I go to thee, though thou hast not known me, that they might know from the rising of the sun from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. That's right. There is only one eternal divine family of love and fellowship and communion called God the Lord. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the parchments strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou, or thy work? He hath no hands. Right. The he is the masculine being of God. Amen. The problem is that one masculine being is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. By the way, who's the arm of the Lord, <laughs> right? It's the same thing. The word of the Lord is the person of the son, right? Right? Was God ever mute? No, God always had his word, but his word is a person distinct from himself. Again, that himself would be the father. Same with the arm of the Lord or the hand. We saw that in uh, Hebrews, when God was speaking in the Son, saying the creation was the work of your hands. So the arm of the Lord, the hand of the Lord, again, is the pre-incarnate Son. And God never had an arm. God, there was never a time when God didn't have, forgive me, an arm or a hand, because the Father always had the Son, right? You can't be a father without a son. You can't be a son without a father. Eternal Father, eternal Son. Now, pay attention to this in terms of this maker concept. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall be call, he be called. But notice husband and maker in the Hebrew, bo alayik, that's, if you go to the right there, it's a masculine plural. That's husbands. And osayik, your maker, again, if you go to the right, masculine plural, makers. So the Lord is your husbands and your makers because that one Lord is more than one masculine person, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then the yod heh vav this is funny. Okay, Hebrew is a pictographic language. In the initial formulation of Hebrew, the yod was a picture of an arm, right? By the way, you know, we look at the arm now as what? From your shoulder, to your um, wrist. But in ancient times, the, the arm was basically from the elbow to the fingertip. So the yod, where we get yard, was the picture of the hand and arm of a man. The length of the arm from the fingertip to elbow is called a cubit. Our word yard as a measurement is the length of the arm. So yod he vav he, it's an arm, which would include the hand and the wrist, obviously. And then the vav, initially, forgive me, the hay initially, forgive me, was a picture of a man with his arms outstretched looking upwards, pointing towards a wonderful view and saying, hey, look at that. So hold on a second. So the name of God, yod hey vav hey, pictographically, would be an arm from the elbow to the fingertip, including the hand, right, and the wrist, right, right where the nail went through in Lord Jesus. And it's a man with his arms outstretched. Hmm. And then the vav, the, the vav was the, 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 basically a peg or a spike. The tent was supported by ropes attached to pegs driven into the ground, you know, the tabernacle of the Lord. These pegs were made of branched pieces of hardwood. No English word is derived from this letter, but the picture is similar to a, a hand of a man waving. So yod he vav he, right? The yod is basically the arm from elbow to fingertip, hand and wrist included. The he would be a man with his arms outstretched. The vav would be a spike or a peg, and then the last hay again. So obviously the name of yod hey vav hey is pictographically of Lord Jesus being on the cross because that was God on the cross. That wasn't just a man. It was a God man. And then we get into the Alpha and Omega, right? Obviously, uh, St. John, right, in Revelation where we see Alpha and Omega, spoke Hebrew. So when Lord Jesus appeared to him, would he be the Alpha and Omega or would it be the Aleph and the Tav? Right? Alpha, first letter of the Greek alphabet, Omega, last letter. Well, in the Hebrew, it would be Aleph and Tav, Aleph, first letter. And the Aleph was the picture of the Hevanach, the strongest and most versatile animal among the Hebrew livestock. 
The ox was used to pull carts or plow provided meat and leather was one of the animals used in sacrifices, the primary sacrificial animal. The animal is the all-powerful, all-versatile animal of the Hebrews. The letter has an A sound, but also an E sound, as an elk and elephant, both of which are also powerful animals. The name of this letter is Aleph, which may be the origin of elephant. So notice yod heh vav -Hey, pictographically, what is a man with his arms outstretched <laughs> with spikes through his hands, basically, and then notice the Aleph and Tav, or Alpha and Omega, is what? The most powerful sacrificial animal. And guess what the um, Tav was? It was two cross sticks. It was a cross. So yod He vav -He is Lord Jesus on the cross. And Alpha and Omega is the sacrificial animal brought to the cross. And Taylor Stewart refuses to see this. You think that's all coincidence, please? And again, Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 to 13. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Who's that? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So whoever's speaking in verse 12 is declaring himself Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The Aleph and Tav, right? The sacrificial animal brought to the cross. How do we know that's Lord Jesus? Well, notice what he says in verse 12. I come quickly with my reward to give every every man according as his work shall be. There's other verses that show this, but I'll show you one. Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he, the Son of Man, shall reward every man according to his works. So it's the Son of Man speaking in Revelation 22, 12, who's declaring himself the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last, because he's God, just not the same person as his Father. And he's the Alpha and Omega because he's the sacrificial animal brought to the cross. And he's yod heh -Vah the family name. And notice the family name is actually named after what the Son's going to do, right? Yod, arm, which includes hand and wrist. Hey, man with arms outstretched, right? Vav is the spike. Deuteronomy chapter 6, let's look at this, verses 2 to 4. That thou might, mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth mil with milk and honey. Then the verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And in the Hebrew, it's Yahweh, Yahovah, yod heh vav -He, Ehad, Ehad, Hebrew Strong's 259. Yahweh is one. All right. And then he mentioned this. Let's show it. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So you need to realize who that is, right? So there's some challenge happening here for you to see God, right? Right? God and this is some sort of spiritual test. I don't know. It'll make sense, uh, I guess, to everyone on the other side. But this is a test, right? You have to really love him, really want to know him, right? So Lord Jesus isn't, say, isn't saying, I'm not God. He's saying God is one. God is one family. You need to see that, right? And thou shalt love. Notice love, love. You shall love the Lord because love is eternal. Love is the nature of God. But love necessitates more than one person, and the second is, like namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's, notice, it's all about love. Yes, it's all about love. God is love, but love is loving another person. So if God is love, love is eternal, that means, unless narcissism is true love, which it's not, God must be more than one person. Uh, there is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. There is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all his soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Why is it all about love? Because God is love. Forgive the repetition. This proves it all, Taylor Stewart. God is love. That's why the Shema Israel so is important. Why? Because it's all about love, because God is love. But wait a minute, what is love? Love is loving another person, not just loving yourself. That's narcissism. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. So he's not in the kingdom. He's getting, he's getting there. He's getting there. He needs to think a little further about it. Wait a minute. Why is love so important? God must be love. But hold on a second. That means must, must, God must be more than one person. 
It's a masculine being. Hey, it's a family, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hey, let's marry into the family, why don't we? And then Ahad, when was Ahad first used? Genesis chapter one, verse five, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So Yom Ahad, so notice what he said. Oh, Ahad, when it refers to you know, something singular, it can't be composite. You're, are you kidding me, Taylor Stewart? Because the very first time it's being used, the first day, that day is singular, but it's a composite of morning and evening. <laughs> Right? So Ehad is used for a composite union. How about the next time Ehad is used? Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Lebasar Ehad. And notice, flesh is singular, but it's a composite union. That one flesh is made up of two persons, husband and wife, right? Man and woman. How about the next time? Genesis chapter 11, verse six. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one and they have all one language and this they begin to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Am Ehad, people singular, Ehad. Again, it's a composite union. The people is a large group of human persons. And by the way, there is a word in Hebrew which means one, one alone, solitary. It's Yahid. Right? Hebrew Strong's 3173. And Yahid is first used in Genesis 22.2, your only son. Genesis 22.12, your only son. Genesis 22.16, your only son. So notice Ehad is used for a composite union. Yahid is used for one and only one, and it's used related to the son, which obviously pre uh, supposes and, and predicts and prophesies the one and only son, Lord Jesus Christ, right? Judges 11.34, one and only child, Psalm 22, 20, one and only life, Psalm 25, 16, one and only, I'm by myself, I'm lonely. Psalm 35, 17, one and only life, Psalm 68, 6, one and only, solitary, alone, Proverbs 4, 3, one and only son, Jeremiah 6, 26, one and only son, Amos 8, 10, one and only son, Zechariah 12, 10, one and only son. So notice Yahid, which is never used for God, Ehad is, composite union. Yahid, one and only one, by myself, is never used. It's used for children, son specifically. I wonder what that means. And it's also referring to being alone and lonely. See, like I mentioned, God is love. God was never alone. God was never lonely. Being lonely is sad. It's desolate. That's not the nature of God obviously. So if God is indeed one and only one person, why wouldn't he describe himself as Yahid? That's the Hebrew word rather than Ehad, which is used, as I showed, to describe a composite union. It's pretty obvious what this means. And again, this is some sort of spiritual challenge, right? Can you see this? Do you want to see this? I do. It's true. I've explained it to you. Can you see it as well? Taylor Stewart can't and won't. I pray that changes for him, of course. Now, to finish off, why do people do this? Well, Isaiah chapter six, verses one to two, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, this is the prophet Isaiah, saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. This is in Solomon's temple, the first temple, high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, right? These angelic spirit creatures. One each had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Verses three to four, and one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. Holy, holy, holy. That means separate, separate, separate. So how is the one being of Lord of hosts thrice separate? It's pretty obvious. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. It's always three, Taylor Stewart. It's never two and it's never four. And notice what happens in Revelation chapter four, verse eight. And the four beasts or living creatures had each of them six wings about them. So these are sort of seraphim. Actually, if you look at them, notice the next statement and they were full of eyes within. That reminds you of the cherubim of, of Ezekiel. And they rest not day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come, right? Past, present, future, holy father, holy son, holy spirit. Isaiah chapter six, continuing verses five to six. Then said I, this is the prophet Isaiah, obviously, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. See, people with unclean lips speak unclean things. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. 
By the way, if you understand the New Testament, the Son had to be there. No man hath seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath revealed him. So the Son was there revealing, right, the Father, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that one masculine being. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my lips and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So now he doesn't have unclean lips, and now he won't speak unclean things, he'll speak clean things. Verses 8 through 10. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? First person singular. And who will go for us? First person plural. Who's the us? Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Go back to Hosea chapter 12, right? Go back to what we saw in Revelation 22. The God, the Father, and the Lamb, the Son, are sitting on the throne, and then his servant shall serve him. But they're serving Father and Son, right? Anyway, so who's the us? I would imagine it's the family, the, the, the family, the three persons of God, the holy, holy, holy. Of course, it could be the seraphim. Then said, I hear am I send me. Pay attention. He said, go and tell this people. These are the people with unclean lips. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. So they hear, but they don't understand. And see indeed, but perceive not. These are people like Taylor Stewart. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So for some reason, they don't really want to understand. They don't really want to perceive. They don't really want to see, right? Because obviously, God is a God of justice. So they don't want to see, and he doesn't let them see because they don't want to see. They don't want to hear. They don't want to understand. They want to believe what they believe. They're their own God. Their thoughts are their own God. Continuing, say chapter 6, verses 11 to 12. Then said I, Lord, how long? How long will people be this way? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord hath removed man far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Seems to me like that's talking about end times. That's how people are going to be that way, right? These people with unclean lips who speak unclean things. I'm sorry, Taylor Stewart, your lips are unclean. You're speaking unclean things. Now, pay attention. That was in Isaiah. Look at John chapter 12. But though he had done so many miracles before them, obviously, Lord Jesus, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake. Lord, who hath believed a report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? See, he's the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord is distinct from the Lord, but this, you know, the, the Lord isn't without his arm ever, right? And there's only one eternal being. So that arm of the Lord and the word of the Lord, right, is the person of the Son. Therefore, they cannot believe because that Isaiah said again, and this, that, by the way, that was from Isaiah 53. Here's Isaiah 6. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. These things, pay attention, said Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him. Wait a minute. That means the Son was there. Exactly. So the Father was there. The Son was there. That's what St. John is speaking right here. That's what he's teaching. He says it right there. You can't see. You can't hear the words, Taylor Stewart. Because the Son was there, but there was only one being there. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. We know who the us is. Let's look at Acts chapter 28. Let's see the Holy Spirit. And when they had appointed him a day, these are certain Jews that St. Paul is trying to explain the gospel. There came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Right? He's doing what I'm doing. Right? He's explaining. He's persuading. And guess what? Some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. And then we agreed not among themselves, right? Some agreed, some didn't agree. They departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Pay attention. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. Wait a minute. The Father was obviously there. Obviously there. John 12 teaches the Son was there. Acts 28 teaches it was the Holy Ghost speaking. Only person speak. This is the Holy Ghost speaking. Verses 26 to 27 saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. So there's the Holy Trinity yet again, the Holy, 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 Isaiah chapter 6, obviously the Father, but Holy, 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 what's that all about? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? What's that all about? John 12, Acts 28, explain it. The Son was there, Isaiah saw his glory, and the Holy Ghost was the one speaking. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. They closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. So... You know, I've heard this described. You see the kind of God that 
kind of is inside you. You're projecting that. So the God that Taylor Stewart is seeing, this lonely God who never really understood love, and since God is love, that God was a lonely narcissist. Huh. I wonder what that means, right? Well, that's obviously completely false. So I pray you found that edifying. That right there, again, that was a over two-hour video. That was just his opening statements. If you enjoyed this video, right, and uh, you'd like me to make more of his arguments or his closing statements, please let me know, and I'll make some, you know, part two, et cetera, Lord willing, in the future. God bless and keep you all. Amen. I pray I spoke truth and interpreted Holy Scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If you did enjoy the video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up, positive comment, share. If you haven't already done so, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could subscribe to the channel. Again, if you don't like the video for whatever reason, feel free to give it a thumbs down and or a negative comment. But again, if you do give it a negative comment, I hope you've watched the entire video and please point out to me what I stated in this video that you believe is wrong. God bless and keep you all. Come Lord Jesus.